Now, today, all we're going to talk about, there, there are three sections to this rebuttal, three sections to the presentation. The first one is the discussion of the anatomic and pathological details concerning the shroud subject's body. And then, uh, secondly, the, the next presentation will be on evidences of the authenticity of the shroud of the first century, is where the barrel cloth. And then we'll talk about the image formation mechanism itself. So today, we're just talking about number one. We'll start by discussing the New Testament account of the suffering and death of Jesus and compare that to what we see in the trial. Now, one night, as you know, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees, had Jesus arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he'd been praying. Now, they had several, um, they came and they brought him before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Council, and there they had several witnesses who brought various charges against Jesus. However, they couldn't quite agree on exactly what it was that, that he'd done wrong. And so finally, Caiaphas, the high priest, comes out and asks Jesus point blank, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? To which Jesus responds, I am. And Jesus was judged as guilty of, of blasphemy at that point, of claiming to be God. And he was judged as guilty of not only blasphemy, but deserving of death. However, Israel at that, uh, at that time was under Roman jurisdiction. And in order to carry out a death sentence, they had to get the Romans to do it. They couldn't legally kill somebody. And so they had to bring Jesus before Pontius Pilate if they wanted to have a death sentence carried out. And here's, here's uh, Caiaphas tearing his robe, which was actually illegal, but uh, there he is saying that Jesus is here. All right, so they brought him before Pilate. But Pilate really did not want to have anything to do with this particular problem. Um, he did not want to do serve as judge over this case. He considered it uh, an internal religious matter. And he sought to have Jesus released. When he discovered that Jesus was a Galilean, he said, hey, you know, he's a Galilean. If he's from Galilee, he's under Herod's jurisdiction. Not, not, not my problem. You, you live in a different county, Val. Okay, so, uh, but it just so happened Herod was in town, uh, all right, for a particular festival, for a, for a Passover festival. And so uh, he sent Jesus over to see Herod. Yeah. But there was also the issue of his wife's dream. Exactly. Oh, that's exactly right. Uh, Pontius Pilate's wife had a dream about Jesus, and she told him to have nothing to do with this man. Um, and so Pilate, you know, probably was aware of that dream and said, "Hey, this is about that dream." So not my problem. He sent him off to see Herod. But unfortunately, when Jesus was sent over to see Herod, Herod said, um, "Herod had been wanting to see Jesus for some time." And uh, remember, Herod, Herod actually thought that Jesus was John the Baptist, risen from the dead. He heard these stories about the miracles and said, oh, it's John the Baptist, risen from the dead. That wasn't necessarily good news for Herod, considering that he had John the Baptist's head cut off. But uh, when, he, when he met Jesus, um, he asked Jesus some questions, tried to get Jesus to perform a miracle. Jesus didn't do anything, didn't say, say anything to him. And so Herod allowed his men to rough Jesus up a bit, but he was still unable to find him guilty of anything. So he sent them back to Pilate, unable to find him um, unable to do anything, so the charge with anything. So Jesus goes back to Pilate, and the religious leaders are not happy with this. They still, they still want Jesus killed, and um, they, and, and Pilate still wants to let him go. And so finally, the religious leaders say, "Look, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar." So now. Pilate's in a little trouble here because if word gets back to the emperor that sedition, you know, this guy was claiming to be a king and they didn't do anything about it and there was people were upset about it, he could be in some, some, some sticky situation. And so he goes, okay, tell you what, I'll have him scourged and that'll teach him a lesson. So Jesus is led out to the court, courtyard and up to a whipping post for a scourging. Now what does a scourging entail? Scourging is not a fun process. It's a very, very difficult thing to, to, to go through. A scourging involves the use of a weapon called the flavor taxilator. And we actually have this weapon available today. Uh, they, they didn't all go away. We have in museums, we have examples of the Roman scourge. And actually, it's described in many aspects of Roman literature. They, they describe uh, plenty. And there are a number, of, uh, uh, a number of Roman authors who describe this particular treatment. This was, there were two, we have two examples of the Roman scourge. Um, this was one where it had, it had a, a handle and then leather straps and then metal dumbbell tips uh, perpendicular to the straps. And there was another, for another brand where the metal dumbbell uh, straps were parallel to the straps. Okay? Now when we look at the back of the man in the shroud, we find 90 to 120 lashes with one of the parallel types, with one of these kinds of playground. Okay, now, flagrant tax I don't know if I mentioned this, it means the horrible scourge. 
it was illegal to use this weapon on a Roman citizen. If you beat a Roman citizen with one of these, you were in trouble. This was only for non-Romans. It was a very terrible way. Many people died under the skirt. They did. And, the, and it, now, in Mel Gibson's movie, um, uh, The Passion, uh, this one part I really was disturbed by was that they, they used it. There was a scourge that had bone in the tips. Okay, so we do have documentation that they used that. However, however, right in the Bible, when it described the scourge, it specifically says the plumbe flavor of the soup. Plumbe version of the soup. So by using the word plumbe, that's plumbe PG stands for lead. Okay? So specifically, even though it doesn't come out in English, the Bible specifically says the plumb, the, the lead tip version of the scourge was used on Christ. Okay, that is in the Bible. And so, and we have that particular, we have examples of that same weapon today, and there's that weapon, and on the back of the man's shroud, 90 to 120 lashes with one of these kinds of scourge, of the plumbing, of the leaded version, with the, with, the, with the metal dumbbell tips in parallel with the leather. And here's a close-up, and you take a look at those metal dumbbell blood markings, and they correspond to the size of the dumbbells in the Roman scourge the same size, the same symmetry. Now think about that. If this is a forgery, go, think like it's a forgery, think like a forger. How did he know? I mean, did he have examples? Did he, did he have archaeological examples? Or was he Roman himself? Where did he get a hold of a weapon that was used by the Romans? The Romans went out of business a long time ago. Okay, so if this is a medieval forgery, this is a 500-year-old weapon for him. Okay? Where did he get his hand on a five-year-old, five, over, over 500-year-old weapon? How did he know the dimensions of that? Pretty smart, pretty smart guy, or gal. You know, <laughs> you know we're talking about a four here, all right? So, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's pretty good. That he knew what kind of weapon he was used and the dimensions of the tool uh, that was used. Now, not only are these markings, yes? Uh, just uh, a thought, though. If you're going to forge it, it would seem like you hit the cloth, you know, with that. And I wondered if that was mashed or if they looked to see if it was or wasn't. You know what I'm saying? If you, uh, I don't know, maybe you could do it a couple different ways, but if you were going to forge it, mm -hmm. and I don't know how you get marks on there unless you put put it in something that would mark it and hit. Oh, how, how did you get, you get yeah, marks? You know what I'm saying? If, it, if it was a forgery, it would seem like you would. Yeah, if it was a forgery, you would expect to find higher concentrations of lead on the pump. Yeah, and then well, not now. Yeah, not only that, but it would be. I think he's might it. be mad at too. If you're a forger, the easiest way uh -huh. instead of marking it just to hit it. Oh right, to hit the cloth. Yeah. So, but that would show, right? If you're yeah, if you were going to strike it, there would be some streaking of the blood. Yeah, it would, it would, or just yeah. matting of the material. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seemed like at that level you could tell that. Yeah, was, but, uh, just asking. <laughs> so. Um, you know, if it was a forgery and they didn't find it matted, because if you're hitting it with that, it would it would mat it pretty good, wouldn't it? If you hit the cloth with it. with with that kind of uh, oh yeah, if you hit well, if you hit the cloth with it, it would. Well, I mean, I'm mean, saying if you were trying, trying to forge, you would dip the dip the dumbbell in blood and touch the cloth. And dip the dumbbell That's a lot of work there, unless it be a lot of work. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> it would be a lot of work. I'm saying if they took the cloth and were studying it, it seemed like a lot of different, you know, uh, angles were looked at to see if it, uh, if that might have happened, you know. It would be easier just to beat somebody. I mean, it really, it really would, seriously. It would be easier to use the weapon, to beat an actual person, and, and then that, it really would. I mean, I'm not so sure the uh, volunteer or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I think you use a slave. You yeah, you use a slave or a prisoner. But I thought it was really, a student. You're going to do a right. If this is a forger, if this is a forger, um, the easiest way to do this is to actually beat somebody. I, mean, I don't. I can't imagine taking it and individually and putting it on there. I think that I don't think that anybody worked that hard. They have to beat somebody, and then use rubble. Okay. Okay. Um, now there are as I said, 90 to 120 lashes. That they're not just localized to the back, but they go all the way down this man's the back of this man's legs, all the way down into the calves. Okay, and then they wrap around. I mean, this is just a, a pictorial diagram of where we see the markings, and then you know, it wraps all the way around. And uh, oh, and also from the directionality, either there were two torture persons 
um, and one on each, each side or one person who switched sides based on the, the direction of where you blow.